Hey, this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares. I'm here with Cooper Andrews. You may know him best from The Walking Dead, playing Jerry. How you doing, buddy? Oh, I'm great. How are you? I'm just lurking, lurking over your shoulder. Okay. I, w- I want to talk to you about something. You, when you first started, you were on Halt and Catch Fire. Yeah. How did you get that gig? Oh, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I did an audition, um, but I played with, uh, uh, my character is Yo-Yo Engberg, and... I used to mess with yo-yos when I was like in middle school and doing like two-handed yo-yo tricks, being able to like trapezes, like, you know, different whatever's like spinning it around and whatnot. And so in my, uh, in my audition, I do my slate and I'm like Cooper Andrews 6'2", and I'm, as I'm doing it, I'm like spinning a yo-yo around my fingers and then I have the yo-yo land on the string and then I flip it off and, and I, I, you know, I don't know if that's what got it, but that definitely like got the attention. Uh, and then I did a callback. Uh, I go in front of the room, and the director for that episode, Ed Bianchi, he goes, uh, he goes, did you bring your yo-yo? And I'm like, I did. And then um, did some did some stuff there. But it was it was a character where I loved it because it was like they, they said he had like an Eskimo esque uh, quality about him. Um, and to me, I was like, I just I, I understood that I understood that guy, and I was refreshing there, yeah. take. Yeah, so I was just like, we're going to have some fun with this. But it was weird because I was a boom operator as a, uh, uh, for years. And, you know, some of the people that I had boomed on, on different shows I was auditioning against. And I was like, oh, this is, this is an odd moment for me. So. That was great. Yeah. Now, how did you get uh, hooked up with The Walking Dead? Um, so when I had done a few, I'd done two auditions prior to being on the show. And... Uh, Scott Gimple had uh, had remembered those auditions, uh, he, he, you know, like years later that when they, they called me in and the character apparently that I just learned was like uh, they had me in mind for uh, to be this thing. So when I did that audition, I had done it in different versions and we didn't use any of those versions on the actual show. The show became this other character which I was happy with. And that's why I learned also just acting advice right here. If you're going to do an audition, make sure you're going to want to do that character for the next six years. Because if you didn't, if I didn't like that character, that would have been a hell for me, you know, like the way I played it, you know, and knowing that like, Oh, I like how I'm playing it this way. Just really happy guy until you flip that switch. And then it's like, you know, this destructor, but I like the idea that my character is like this happy protector. Um, and then I was sort of able to like lean into that that aspect of it. So, knowing that I had done an AMC show, knowing I was on like Halt and Catch Fire, that also helped. Like, and when I was ending on that show, there was actually a little bit of an overlap. So I was on Walking Dead doing Halt and Catch Fire, and then and then stayed on for Walking Dead for the next six years, five seasons. Yeah. Are you done filming The Walking Dead? Yeah, we we all are. Uh, we we finished in end of March and. You know, it was a very emotional moment for everybody. Um, I made a point. I remember telling uh, one of my friends, I'm like, when I give my goodbye speech, I'm going to try and make everybody cry. I got pretty close. <laughs> so, And anyone who didn't cry was heartless when well, my goodbyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great show, and you were, had a great character. Now you're in the Shazam series. Yes. So what is that like? Oh, it's a, you know, it, what was cool about Shazam we did. I did the first Shazam after season eight, between season eight and season nine of the show, and the way we do Walking Dead, like all the cast, we all get together. We would have like, you know, I mean, so much food. Every time I think of all my actor friends, I'm like, why am I the one eating all the food? But we we do these dinners and we would do these things that would and just hangouts. And when it came to Shazam, I you know I was like I've been like I've been lucky to have all these other actors do this thing and with Shazam I was like this is what we're gonna do with the kids so tried to do as many dinners and as many hangouts like YouTube nights where we would show all our old you know videos of stuff you know it's like let's see what you did you know just seeing the kids when they're really young and like they were young then but like really young and uh but it was just trying to get to know everybody and that's and that's what makes Walking Dead work is because we're all so close that when you get a scene, even if it's like a, you know, whenever you, like a scene where you're like, okay, what are we quite doing? But you know that chemistry will be there because we're with a bunch of people that we're close with. Shazam, like that same thing. But, you know, but then you have people like, you know, Zach Levi, who's awesome dude. And like, he would have like all these gatherings to like make sure we were just always hanging. So he was part of that same, that same sort of idea. So it was just a very, Shazam was just, I mean, they're, 
Shazam and Walking Dead of all the things I've done, those are like I mean, those are the people I'm closest with are those are those casts and it's like it's just oh man. Shazam is a different thing. It's like it's family and I don't have to worry about any of you dying. You know, it's like any of you getting eaten by a walker. You know? What do you think of the new trailer? Oh man, it's uh I'm it, well, I think about the whole movie in itself. I mean, I think it shows what a lot of what that movie is going to be like. But it's what we did in the first one, which was super funny. A lot of like a lot of family, a lot you know, a lot of fun action. I think we just take it and just just make it like to the proper next level. Um, I, I'm actually really excited about it. So I saw that trailer, and I'm like, every time you watch a trailer, you're always like, okay, how's this going to look, you know? And then and then just seeing because I think it's our character, you know, like. We're so used to, we've seen the flying, we've seen the punching, we, we've seen it done so many times where it's like, that's a really big bird for that kind of bird, by the way. Um, look at that bird, sorry. That's a, it looks bigger than, okay, sorry. Um, but uh, uh, um, what were we just talking about? I'm sorry, that's a big, for that type of bird, that's a really big bird. Um, uh, uh, well, <laughs> this is gonna be. We're, we're actually looking at a bird outside, and it's really big, and it's walking this way. But like, it's it looks like a chicken, but it's it's a fat bird, right? For that, it's tiny. Come, hey bird, come closer. This way. Um. <laughs> yeah. So, so the trailer was awesome. Now, yeah. What do you got coming down the pipeline? Um, besides Shazam, there's nothing I'm allowed to talk about. No, but that's okay. Stuff. We're not going to try to coax you. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, some projects that we've been working on for a few years are now moving on to the next so you got an level. Future. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm, every time I think about it, I just start sweating. I'm like, all right, we're going to, it's going to get exhausting. But, yeah, no, it's it some fun, some fun stuff I've been wanting to do for a little while now. Um, collaborations with uh with other friends i got this cartoon that'll be which i don't even think i'm a stuff it's coming okay. you'll see it well, cooper <laughs> it was a pleasure i don't take it, want to take up too much of your time but it was a pleasure speaking with you thank you and this is mark at motor city nightmares with jerry Hey, this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares. I'm here with legendary actor Richard Masser. You might know him from The Thing and It. How you doing, sir? I'm doing fine. It's been fun. Tell us, how did you get involved uh, with the movie The Thing? Uh, well, uh, John Carpenter was someone I knew. Uh, he was friends with a friend of mine, and uh, I got a call to go in and meet with him. We sat down. Uh, he, they sent me the script. I loved the script. We sat down, we talked, and... Uh, he asked me what I was interested in, and I said I really liked the dog handler, and that was it. <laughs> so he gave you that choice. Uh, we knew each other, and I'd done a lot of work at that point, so uh, yeah. So what did you think of all the effects in the movie? Well, I, I, was, I was really impressed when I, I Rob Bottin's work was just extraordinary, but we didn't, we didn't see a lot of it while we were shooting. I mean, one of the things we saw was the like the the burn stuff from the from the Norwegian camp, you know that big pile of part dog part, mm -hmm. you know, and then also the the um, um, the other burn mess, uh, rather, which was all the dogs and everything, uh, you know, and uh, where Wilfred's snapping pieces off of it, and when he's trying to examine it, uh, and and the the. The material that was underneath all the slime and the blood and everything was this beautiful, grotesque, but beautiful sculpture that Rob had done out of uh, clay originally, and then, and then it was cast in some kind of a, uh, a resin. And it was just beautiful, and then he covered it with all this stuff. I was really was sad incredible. that he, yeah, he was great. Yeah. Yeah. So How'd you get involved in it? Similar story. I'd done a film with uh, Jim Green and Alan Epstein, who were the producers of the film. Uh, I'd, I'd done a film called Fallen Angel with them, and uh, I got a call, and Jim said, we're doing Stephen King's It. Would you be willing to come up to Vancouver and play the, do this role? And so I, I, read, I read the script, and I was talking to him about, oh, what, this, this, this? He said... Well, we we sort of have all those cast ready. Would you do Stan? And I said, Well, he's in two scenes. What do you mean? You want me to do that? 
because I'd done this, the lead in this other film. He said, yeah, we'd really like you to do it if you could. Because Anyway, so I went, and I was happy to do it, but it was very, very physically problematic. In one, in one sequence, I'm, I'm lying in a bathtub for hours with, you know, uh, to get the shot of me having killed myself. And then in another sequence, I have a, the, the actual grate of a, of a little refrigerator embedded in my neck with a prosthetic mm-hmm. and and I'm walking around with that on my neck for like 10 hours I was very very uncomfortable so when we finished everything they were like oh thank you so much uh, and, and uh, I, I the deal I had made with them was that I would come up I they didn't have any money because they had spent it all on everybody else I said okay I'll do it but here's the thing you have to buy me a piece of uh, a piece of Native American art, uh, a Native Canadian actually art. So if you're willing to do that, and they agreed, and 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 I went and I found a thing that I wanted, and they freaked out because it was more money than they were expecting, and I said, "Sorry, this is it." I'd like to roll it back a little bit and talk to you about a movie that was a childhood movie favorite movie of mine. It was called Scavenger Hunt. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I, actually, at these every once in a while, somebody brings me a poster or something or a DVD. Also, uh, lately, I think it just came out not long ago on DVD. Um, that was that was one of the craziest things I've ever been involved with, uh, because it was so many strong personalities all together. Especially when we were shooting the stuff where we're bringing the stuff into the. Into the, uh, into the yeah into the pens uh, the pens rather yeah. and um, yeah I mean uh, and and working the whole time with Cloris and Richard Benjamin was uh, Richard was a treat and Cloris was a challenge though I love her I really love her but she's like she was like a, a, a machine gun of of ideas and she was just you you didn't know from one second to the next what she was going to do. She would do all these crazy things, and some of them were great, and some of them just screwed up the scene so badly. And and so Richard and I were constantly like grabbing each other. Like one of us would pop, and the other one would walk the other one aside and say, "Okay, calm down. It's going to be all right," you know. But I, I ultimately, I was I was pleased with how the whole film came out. I thought it was a fun film and. So many great people to be around. Um, I mean, I've I've never worked with a, a that deep a cast of really really talented talented funny people. It was great. An Indian. <laughs> um, uh, that was actually modeled after a next door neighbor's kid. His name was Nicky Levine, and I I created the entire character based on Nicky. Is this your first time back in Detroit since working on Sixty One? Oh, back to, yes, yes. I have not been here since we shot at Tiger Stadium. I was actually an extra in that movie, and I remember seeing you a bunch of times. That was a treat, because Billy's, Billy uh, Crystal is such a lovely man, and very good director also, and and this was a, a work of passion for him because he's the, like the world's biggest Yankee fan. I personally hate the Yankees because I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. And <laughs> if you grew up a Brooklyn Dodger fan, you hated the Yankees. And, there's, and I never got over it. So I, and I was always razzing him about it. And in fact, right by Tiger Stadium, there used to be a little tiny store standing all by itself after they built the other stadium. Mm -hmm. And this store was a a sports memorabilia store. I don't know if you remember this thing. Yeah. yeah. And and so one time when I had a break, I I ran down there and wanted to see what they had. And I bought a vintage Brooklyn Dodger cap and uh, also a cap for a friend of mine who was from from, uh, Bloomington. Bloomington? Bloom... From Bloomfield Hills. Bloomfield Hills, sorry. Yes. yeah, yeah, um, and and uh, uh, so I I bought him a, uh, I bought him a, 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 a vintage tiger cap, and uh, anyway, so I walked back over to the uh, I walked back over to Tiger Stadium, and you know they're setting up a shot, and I come walking on the on the uh, on the field with this uh, uh, Dodger cap on, this Brooklyn cap on. 
And uh, Billy looks up. He says, get that fucking cap off. I say, go fuck yourself. And I wore it every day from then on. <laughs> That's a great story. Anyways, it was a pleasure speaking with you, Richard. It was, it was not nice to meet you. And this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares with Richard Masser. Hey, this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares. I'm here with makeup artist extraordinaire V. Neal. How you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. So tell me, when did you get started doing makeup? Oh, in the early 70s, I became kind of professional then. Mid-70s, let's say. What was the first like job that you got to work on? Well, the first big job I got to work on when I was in the union was Star Trek The Motion Picture. Oh, what was that like? What makeup did you do on that show? I did Bill Shatner and a couple of the other guys on the bridge. I did the one alien that had the big forehead on the bridge. And I did, I did all the test makeups on all the Klingons. And then I also did Mark Leonard's makeup and the other head Klingon that worked with him in that scene. So how did you get hooked up working on Tim Burton's films? Well, I was doing the film The Lost Boys, and my friend Bo Welch, who was the production designer, said, V, I just got this script to go do this film with this director named Tim Burton, and he says, it's right up your alley. you got to go work on this movie. And so I figured out who was the production people on the film, and I started pestering him until I got an interview with Tim, and I got the movie. And that was Beetlejuice? That was Beetlejuice. <laughs> so what was that like, putting on Michael Keaton's makeup during this production? Uh, it was great because we got to work with Michael. We really didn't have a budget. I mean, we were basically redheaded stepchildren at that point. And we used swollen lips to create his broken nose. And <laughs> that were like, you know, we just had sitting around basically, and we just ran a whole bunch of them. And my assistant, uh, Steve Laporte, made his teeth. And we made ball caps to put on him every day, and <clears throat> we just sort of, you know, winged it, and that's how we came up with Beetlejuice. We did a couple of tests for Tim, and he liked them, and that's how we started the film. And then you got to work on Batman Returns and Ed Wood. I'd like to talk to you about Ed Wood. How much uh, did you have to do with put, applying Martin Landau's makeup? I did all of Martin Landau's makeup. That was incredible makeup, and you deserve all the accolades and awards for that. Well, thank you very much. That was designed by the fabulous Rick Baker. And Rick and I won the Oscar that year for that film, along with Yolanda Tusing, who did the hair on it. Was that the only time you worked with Rick? No, I worked with him on The Grinch as well. I did Christine Baranski's makeup for The Grinch. I played The Grinch's girlfriend. So while you were applying Martin's makeup on Ed Wood, was he trying to get in into character as that makeup was being applied? I don't think so. I think we were just doing the makeup and enjoying the, you know, the process, but he was he was once he got into it, he was definitely into the character. Did you have to use sort of like a, a busk of Bella Lugosi to duplicate that makeup on Martin? No, not really. Um, Rick did the original test makeup on him and we found that he looked way too healthy. And as I started doing the makeup, I realized that really in order to get it to look the way we needed it to look on black and white film, I almost had to do the makeup in black and white. So I switched over from using a lot of the warmer flesh tones to cooler tones like taupes and grays to accommodate the film. It just seemed to work much more easily that way. Okay, one final question. Um, when you working on that film with Ed Wood, did your relationship with Johnny Depp get you the work on Pirates of the Caribbean? No, I had already done films with Johnny before that, so we were already friends. <laughs> okay. well, I figured that. I was just wondering, like after working with him so long, that just he just asked to have you on his other movie. Yes, he did. That was and that was very sweet of him. And that's probably one of the biggest compliments of getting work in this industry. You're absolutely right. It is. So, okay, what do you have coming down the pipeline? I am opening a makeup school. So anybody that wants to learn how to do makeup, Legends Makeup Academy in California. Okay. Well, it was a pleasure speaking with you, V. Thank you. And this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares with the legendary V. Neal. Thanks, guys. Joe Johnson here with the great Stephen Jeffries. How are you, Stephen? Great to see you. Thank you. Everything's uh, coming up roses. <laughs> Talk about the environment here today, meeting uh, the people who enjoy your work. 
Yeah, I mean, these uh, conventions are always just like uh, one big love fest. I mean, everyone's here because they want to be and they get so much enjoyment out of it. And, uh, and that, of course, you know, it's infectious. So it's, it's a very up, uh, positive atmosphere. Fright Night was one of the great movies to come out of 80s, just a great era for movies. What are your memories working with that amazing cast on that movie? Yeah, it, it, everyone in it was uh, perfectly cast, and uh, we were all very excited about it. You know, I mean, we all wanted to make sure that it turned out uh, good, and, uh, and it, I think it did, and... Um, yeah, we were all just, it, it was a blast making it. Roddy McDowell, a legend at the time. What was it like working with Roddy? Um, it, I, I, it was just, I, I mean, I was overwhelmed. Uh, he, he, he's, he's the real deal, you know. He's, he's um, like Hollywood royalty, you know, and uh, re really sweet wonderful person a very nice man and now you had some great moments great lines in the movie I I say you stole the movie what are some of the lines that people come up to you and go say the line um, I, I would uh, I would put your so cool Brewster at the top um, and uh, it, it, the, the, the writing you know Tom Holland wrote wrote a great script so um, it was you know, the, the, the entire script was great, um, and, uh, you know, oh, his dinner's in the oven, that's right, how could I forget that, but, um, but yeah, it was, and a big hickey, too, that was, a yeah, 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 there you go, now, what are your memories of seeing the movie for the first time with those amazing practical effects? What was your reaction sitting in the theater watching the movie? Yeah, it, it, it was just magical, you know, um, because you don't know what goes on after the film wraps. So you see all of the wonderful work that uh, people put into making it uh, as good as it was. So it was wonderful. Now, you told me earlier those contacts weren't the most comfortable. No, they, uh, they were brutal. They were painful. Um, but, you know, it was worth it. You know, the, uh, the end result ma made it uh, well worth the pain. Here we are 35 years later, almost 40 years later. We're still talking about Fright Night. What does that mean to you? Um... You know, you, you never know when you make a movie, you know, how it's going to end up. But, you know, the fact that I'm here talking to you uh, after all this time is uh, pretty amazing. Never would have thought. That's awesome. Pleasure meeting you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Joe Johnson here for Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi from Motor City Nightmares. Hey, this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares. I'm here with Kathleen Kinmont. You recognized her from the awesome horror movie, Bride of the Reanimator, and maybe some like 80s uh, sexploit comedies like Fraternity Vacation. Yeah. How you doing, hon? I'm good, thank you. I know I get to sit right with my old friend, Stephen Jeffries. Yes, yes. from treat. Yes. So what, what is it like coming to these cons and meeting all your fans? Oh, it's always wonderful. Always great to see people and get their reaction from films that have touched them in some way that, you know, they're, they're passing it down to their kids and you get this new fan base and it's just wonderful. People are, are really uh, loyal and, and they really care and these films hold up. You know, Halloween 4 and Bride of Reanimator, they're kind of like these, you know, kind of legendary. You, you don't know you're doing it, what, that you're part of something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're both a franchise, so it's nice to be part of a really cool, you know, something that was already built in, but it's great. I love the fans. They, uh, they're they beautiful, fun people. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah. yes, we are, and I thank you for that comment, because yeah. I am a fan. Yes, but thank you. Also, on Bride of the Animator, how did you get involved in that project? 
I auditioned like uh, like an actor does. Um, I had an agent that got me uh, the audition, and I went in, and it was a very bizarre audition because it was a lot of really just reacting and being physically animated and having a connection with my body and and a connection emotionally with what was going on with that particular human. So it was. It, it, it was just kind of a freeing experience because it wasn't like dialogue and you know having a normal conversation. But the, me, as Gloria, dies pretty quickly at the beginning of the film, and they got another person to play my body leaving the bed. I don't know if you ever noticed that, but it's a very tiny human, and I'm like five foot ten, and <laughs> you know. So when they put all of the body parts. You know, you just take that in as an actor and just think like, what would that be like? So it, personally, I was so young, it, it freed me up to let me know that like, you can just do anything in this business and, and be something that wouldn't normally, you know, coming off a fraternity vacation and hard bodies, you know, to get to play a monster like that. And not, and not you know, a monster monster trying to kill people, but something that was from another, you know, stratosphere. <laughs> and the guys, the K&B guys, Howard, Bob, Greg, you know, those guys were just such, you know, young, awesome, visionary artists, and they took care of me, and their assistants took care of me, and, you know, it was it was a great experience. And Jeffrey and Bruce, I mean, what a, what a and Brian Usna, I mean, such an awesome cast and, and great director. I was totally protected the whole time, so. It was a neat experience to have that as a youth, you know, I think I was early 20s, you know, so, and I was scared shitless, really, because I hadn't seen the reanimator and I had just worked with Barbara, so, mm, that's you know, right, Barbara Cramp right. was in the first one. That's exactly, right. so I, I got the part, went to go pick up the script, and they gave me the VHS of the reanimator, mm -hmm. and I went home and watched that, and I was like, oh, my God. Oh my God. And my, uh, the scene with the doctor's heads going into Barbara's right crotch. Down there. Yeah, yeah. That was full commitment. And they kept it in. And it was intense. And I was like watching it with Lorenzo because we were married at the time. And, and I was like, I was flipping out going, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. And he's like, oh, you're going to have a great time. This is campy, fun, you know, amazing you know, wildness. Just so he wasn't a jealous husband, huh? <laughs> well, no, because I didn't have the doctor's head in my crotch. I mean, although K&B was, you know, artistically gluing pubes onto me, you know, day one. And I'm like, you know, after that, I'm like, okay, guys, we don't need to do that anymore. We, you know, we got this. But yeah, it was, I had to really turn myself over for, for uh, being somebody's canvas, right? You know, you... You become somebody else's vision, and that was K and B and Brian Usna and the and the whole um, Reanimator series, and I I got lucky enough to be picked. So. Well, it wasn't luck. I think talent and looks had to do with it too. Oh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> By the way, you haven't aged a bit since I've seen you in the last 20 years. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the ring light. The ring light always helps. Yeah. Thank so you. So, what else do you got coming down the pipeline? Anything interesting? Any? I do. I've, I've got a, a new series coming out called Phoenix. Uh, it hasn't got the platform yet. They're deciding international distribution right now. I just did a movie with uh, Kristana Loken called Vice and Virtue, which is going to Sundance. And I've got this book. Oh, so handy. I wrote a book called I Should Have Been Nicer to Quentin Tarantino and other short stories of epic fails and saves. And I wrote it. It's a uh, 52 chapters of short stories of all the things that I thought were a great big monumental failure in my life. And uh, they actually turned out to be really great lessons and, and part of who I am, you know, part of, part of my armor. And, uh, Do you know, has Tarantino read that book? I don't know if he's read it yet. He's been sent a copy and he knew that I wrote it. So we'll see. But. So where can people find the book? Uh, people can find my book on Amazon and Kindle, and I also did the Audible during COVID. So I wrote, I read it, I wrote it, I cried, I laughed. I, I there's a really beautiful foreword by Nick Vallelonga, who is the Academy Award winner from Green Book, 
who I made a movie, uh, The Corporate Ladder, with. Okay. And he's a great friend. So, and he, he actually did the Audible version for me, too. So, yeah, so that's kind of cool. Yeah. So, if you really want to retain, Audible and read. That's. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Anyways, Kathleen, it was a pleasure speaking with you. It was an honor. And this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares with the hottest babe in the room. Hey, this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares. I'm here with Brad Greenquist. He's the guy that you remember from Pet Cemetery as the, the ghost zombie. How you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Now, did you ever think like people would be talking about this movie like what 30 something years later i never thought so no it was a you know it was a low budget uh, horror movie at the time and uh it was before horror movies were really so accepted you, you know what i mean and uh so i thought it was you know it was a fun job it was a good movie but i thought like most films it would kind of disappear but it's i think it's more popular now than it was when we first opened do you get recognized as that character a lot? Yeah, I do. I do, even without all the, the brains and the blood and all of that, you know. And I've seen you've done uh, plenty of other work, you know. It looks like it's at uh, Star Trek. Yeah. yeah. So what was it like uh, working on the Star Trek series? Well, uh, again, it was like Pet Cemetery, a lot of makeup, you know. Uh, you're in that, that makeup chair four or five hours. Uh, so that's hard. And it, uh, wearing all that makeup is kind of exhausting. Uh, it just takes a lot of energy because your skin can't breathe, you know. So depending on how much it is, uh, the, the Star Trek makeups were pretty extensive, and those those were just exhausting, uh, much more so than Pet Cemetery. Now, one of the cool thing about these cons is it likes to bring you guys back or or keeps you guys, you know, in this in, you know in this whole realm of entertainment and people coming and talking to you what do you think about fans coming over there and talking about your movies and things oh like it's that? great it's lovely um the fans are really really so sweet and so kind and it's nice to be uh told by people that that what i do matters mattered to them in their lives and they get so excited and you know um it's great it's, it's there, there's nothing more gratifying so what do you got coming down the pipeline? You have anything coming out? Oh yeah, yeah, a few, a few things, but I can't, you know, I can't talk about. Understandable. <laughs> Understandable. Well, Brad, it was a pleasure speaking with you. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares with Brad Greenquist. <laughs>